In today's webinar, you will learn about passive fire containment and the importance to firefighter safety. This 60-minute webinar will focus on passive protection, mostly focusing on fire stop systems. We will discuss what a fire stop consists of, where they are located, and the importance of proper inspection and maintenance of these safety systems. We will also discuss the modern fire environment and how these systems operate to provide safety to the operating firefighters during an emergency response. Following the presentation, we will open it up for questions. John Baliulis, Technical Director, International Fire Stop Council, will be available along with our UL presenters to answer questions. I would like to now introduce our presenters, Shonda Crane and Luke Woods. Sean retired as a 25-plus year veteran of the Cleveland Division of Fire. He rose through the ranks and served in various roles, including Director of Training and Acting Chief of Operations. He retired as a battalion chief covering Cleveland's west side. Sean is currently manager of industry relations for Underwriters Laboratories, Building Life, Safety, Security, and Technologies Division. Luke Woods is the principal engineer for the Fire Resistance and Containment Group with UL in Northbrook, Illinois. His experience concentrates on fire protection testing, researching, and the evaluation of building materials and systems under various fire conditions. Luke is also the ambassador for you at technical committees throughout the fire protection industry. It's all yours, Sean. Thank you, Margie. I appreciate it. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, you know, due to my ADHD, usually I walk around. If anybody's ever seen me present, I usually walk around the room, but now I'm confined to this computer. So I hope I can convey the message as effectively. Uh, this is an important message for us, and um, I'm going to kind of Due to time constraints, there are some slides we'll probably uh, move through pretty rapidly, but I believe we're going to make the PDF of this presentation available afterwards online. So well, as we move forward today, what we're going to kind of cover is we're going to cover a little bit of an introduction. We're going to talk a little bit about who UL is. We're going to talk about passive fire protection, the importance of fire compartmentation, uh, my colleague, Luke Woods, will talk about UL 263 and 1479. We'll start to cover some of the best inspection practices as it applies to fire stop materials and also the importance of a balanced approach to fire protection. And we'll also review some resources available to you through UL. So at the end of the webinar, you should be ex able to explain the importance of passive fire protection describe how fire, passive fire protection is tested and certified, understand the role of fire compartmentation in passive fire protection, be able to inspect buildings for adherence to passive fire protection best practices, and explain the role of NFPA 101 in passive fire protection. So who is UL? Well, UL was actually founded in 1894 by William Henry Merrill. Uh, he was a graduate of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and he was drawn to Europe, or I should say he was drawn to Chicago due to the 1893 World's Fair. He wasn't necessarily attending as a spectator, but he was invited at the uh, proprietor's uh, request from the World's Fair. What was unique about the 1893 World's Fair is at the time, they were debuting the Palace of Electricity. And this is also the time where there was the great debate between Thomas Edison and Nicholas Tesla. Tesla on AC versus DC. So if you could think about, we even struggle today on safely harnessing and delivering electrical energy to our residential and, and commercial environments. Think about where they were 124 years ago. So as they were struggling with this, they realized the number of spot fires. They were also realizing a number of, um, sorry about that, uh, a number of false alarms with the alarm system. So they invited William Henry Merrill to come out and do some investigation to see if they could find some corrections to this. This led to him finding the Underwriters Electrical Bureau in 1894. Now the interesting thing from my perspective as a retired firefighter is that the very first office of UL was in a Chicago fire station. So the very infancy of UL is tied to the fire service. And I believe this is 
this is important, and it's also appropriate because if we look at the mission of UL, it is to promote a safe living and working environment through the application of safety science and hazardous-based safety engineering. This fits very well into the mission of the fire service. Uh, and just to add, although UL is based in North America, we are not North American centric. UL is a global company with 15,000 employees stationed across the world. So our goal is actually to promote safe living and working environments throughout the world. And we, we work with the fire service internationally, not just here in North America. Just a little bit of history on UL. Uh, very, from the very beginning, UL established a uh, sound uh, research approach to fire testing, fire testing that would translate to a safer occupancy for those, for those residents, whether it's in their home or whether it's in their place of work. Uh, no, there is not an effort to go back to these mutton chops as a requisite for working at UL, although it does have a good look. But you could see from the history of UL back to 1903 for tin-clad fire doors to 1918 establishing UL-72 on the record protection to the establishment of UL-263 in 1923 to test the building construction of structural elements. Uh, UL has a long history of establishing these test standards in order to effectively deliver uh, safer products and safer systems to our environment. What is the reach of UL? Well, annually, uh, currently, UL mark appears on 22 billion products annually. Over 700 million consumers are touched by UL and the work that UL does. UL has uh, currently almost 1,500 test standards. And it's important to understand that UL, since 1894, has operated as a non-for-profit entity. In 2011, we created a for-profit entity, UL LLC, which will conduct testing and also uh, work to, with customers to get their products tested and listed. But the test standards are owned and managed by that non-for-profit entity very similar to ASTM and other test standard creating organizations throughout the world. We've tested uh, over 20,000 products, almost 70,000 manufacturers come to UL, uh, and more importantly, when a manufacturer comes to UL to have their product tested and listed, UL then institutes a follow-up service where we'll actually go and visit that manufacturing site three to four times a year to ensure that that manufacturing process is remaining consistent. In other words, we want to make sure that the that that product you bring to UL that we test and certify is the product that you consistently manufacture and deliver to the consumer. This is one of those slides we're going to skip. <laughs> so I'm going to talk a little bit today about the firefighters' work environment. And we talk about the work environment. It's, very, it's important that we establish clearly what we are talking about. If I ask a firefighter that I want to improve your work environment, we may have a discussion as it relates to the installation of exhaust systems on the apparatus floor. So when the apparatus starts or returns to quarters, that exhaust is directly uh, exhausted to the outside. Or we may talk about building a, a high, pre or I should say a positive pressure room at the back of the apparatus bay where we put our PPE in so the exhaust goes to the outside, the contaminants do not stay in the living quarters. While I'm improving the firefighters uh, area, I'm not actually improving their work environment. I'm improving their staging area. Their work environment are the buildings that they respond to and operate in every single day. In many cases, that state, or I should say that work environment is under duress, either from fire or other emergencies. So if we really want to affect that work environment in a positive way, we have, to under or we have to make sure that the firefighters actually understand that work environment. They understand the building construction or topography of that work environment, and they also understand the physics of fire behavior and how the fire is going to react to their decision-making on the fire ground. Uh, that's where Steve Kerber's FSRI comes into and in the research that we're doing over there. Because if we start to look at the firefighters' experience on the fire ground, 
we start to see some numbers that really concern us. In 2002, NFPA issued an analytical report or comparative report. They were looking at firefighter fatalities on the fire ground from the 1970s compared to the late 1990s. What they found is in the 1970s, we lost 2.6 firefighters per 100,000 structure fires from a cardiovascular event. In the 1990s, that number dropped to 1.9 per 100,000 structure fighters. Does it mean we've conquered the cardiovascular issue in the fire service? No, it does not. Uh, it still is the number one cause of the line of duty death for firefighters in the U.S. right now. But the numbers that were really troubling is in the 1970s, we lost 1.8 firefighters per 100,000 structure fires from a traumatic injury, a fall, burns, asphyxiation. In the 1990s, that number jumped to three. We're almost doubling the number of firefighters from traumatic injuries uh, on the fire ground. This in a time when we're reducing the annual number of fire, fires that we're experiencing throughout the U.S. We also can't forget the injuries. Uh, the injuries, we'll see almost 80,000 firefighters injured every year in the U.S. Over four, about 40,000 of those will be on the fire ground. This is a significant cost to our local communities. We tried, I should say, the National Institute of Standards and Technology tried to quantify the lifetime cost of one year of injuries. They actually looked back at the year of 2004, tried to quantify what the lifetime cost of injuries would be. They looked at administrative costs. They looked at overtime costs. They looked at medical costs, rehab costs, replacement costs. And though this was a big challenge, what they estimated that the lifetime cost of one year of injuries would be anywhere from $3.2 billion to $7.4 billion. Now, if we start to compound that every single year, we can see the incredible cost of just one year of injuries has on our local communities. So if we can start to reduce the injuries, think about the cost savings, not to mention the savings in the experiences of these firefighters. Many of these injuries are career-threatening or life-altering. So what are some of the contributing factors? Well, we're limited to an hour today, but some of the contributing factors that we can reference, uh, the use of thermoplastics in the home. We've seen the saturation in the marketplace of the polyurethane foam furniture. Uh, the use of turnout gear and enhancements. Are we encapsulating our firefighters so well that they're not recognizing the rapid changing environment around them. The insulation factors, we're wrapping our buildings in plastic. Uh, our energy conservations are driving this, and to the benefit of society, but we have to look at these impacts as a whole. And also our building codes are allowing less mass and more protection trade-offs. And that's kind of what we want to talk about a little bit later in this. Do we want to put all our protection features into one basket? So what does that modern work environment for the firefighter or modern fire environment look like? UL, Steve Kerber's team at FSRI tried to quantify it. And we had a big discussion on the impact of furniture. And here on the slide, you'll see on your left, uh, modern furniture, or we'll call synthetic furniture. It's got press board construction for the framing, polyurethane foam or a substitute for the foaming, and a synthetic covering. On your right, you'll see what we would typically see in homes years ago. Solid wood construction, cotton batting, all natural fibers over the covering. In fact, the only thing that's missing in this demonstration here is the plastic covering my grandmother used to throw on that couch every day. So we wanted to see how these operate, there, I should say how they perform differently under fire conditions. So this next video is going to be conducted in Building 11 at UL. It's where we do our commodity testing. It is uh, roughly 120 feet by 120 feet and 60 feet high. So it's a significantly large building. And I wanted to point that out before I start the, the video for a specific reason as we get into. You'll see your uh, natural room on the left, and you'll see your synthetic room on the right. Uh, we're going to start this simply by simu simulating a candle in the corner of the furniture. Initially in this flame, you start to see the flaming showing in this, in this natural room. The flame is exposing itself. Over on the right, what do you notice as the main byproduct of this fire? It is the smoke. 
as we say in the fire service, smoke is fuel. It's not only toxic, but it, it, it is flammable. So as we start to progress this forward, we start to think about the time frame. You see a flaming pool fire as that polyurethane foam smelt, melts and then ignites. So we're assaulting that furniture from the top and the bottom. Then you see the off-gassing of the other combustibles, and then we transition to flashover. That flashover time takes approximately 30, 3 minutes and 40 seconds. On the left, that natural room still continues to burn at a much slower rate, and it's also you see the, reduction, the reduced production of smoke. That fire there was not darkening down. What was happening is that fire on the right was producing so much smoke that it actually completely filled that room that's 120 feet by 120 feet by 60 feet high where the smoke was banking down and covering the lights, making the filming more difficult. So if we start to think about the makeup of today's typical single family home, that first floor is wide open. We do that for our social reasons. We do that for lighting reasons. Uh, my home doesn't have a solid wall on that first floor except for the bathroom area. We like that wide open spacing and that wide open feeling. But we lose the compartmentation aspect of the, of the home from that was built 30, 40 years ago. We usually also have that unprotected stairwell going to the second floor where the sleeping quarters are. So we could start to think about the concern about these fast moving fires and the risk that they pose to uh, the occupants and not only in a residential property, but also in commercial properties and office spaces and, and retail. And does this fuel load continue to evolve? Absolutely. Uh, Dan Madrakowski from uh, FSRI, ULFSRI, conducted a series of 80 tests looking at cause and origin, uh, looking at the impact of ventilation on interior fire spread. And when you conduct 80 tests, you want consistency. You want to eliminate any variables. And one of the variables is your fuel load. So you want to maintain that fuel load consistently through those fires. So Dan ordered a large number or a large number of chairs and couches for his test. And we noticed that they were actually very light. So Dan removed the covering of one of these chairs and we actually found that framing that used to be solid wood and went to press board construction is now rigid polystyrene. So that fuel load continues to change. Does it have an impact on occupant safety? Well, testing says it does. Back in 1978, the National Institute of Standards and Technology conducted a test looking at the effectiveness of smoke alarms. What they were measuring is the amount of time an occupant would have when the smoke alarm activated until conditions became untenable. They estimated that the occupants of our buildings, our residential buildings, had approximately 17 minutes to affect the egress. In 2010, they replicated those tests, the Dunes 2 study. The only thing they replaced was the furniture. That 17 minutes to escape has now been reduced to three minutes. So any delay of that occupant, any uh, impediment to that occupant's egress now puts them at risk. Now, if that occupant can't affect egress, it also puts the responding firefighter at risk. Because if that firefighter shows up and the occupant is outside of the house, they have uh, various tactical considerations that they can deploy. If that occupant is still inside the house or inside the building, then life safety becomes a critical factor and then places that responding firefighter in a position where they need to make an aggressive attack. So it really comes down to a balance in how we approach protection. As we approach, or I should say, as we approach safety in the fire service, if we look at our breathing apparatus, we want redundancy in that breathing apparatus. When I got on the job, we had a single bell that would go off when that air supply became low. As we progressed, we realized that that bell wasn't sufficient to give that firefighter time. Uh, the bell could turn upside down and fill with water or debris. Uh, the firefighter couldn't hear it sometimes because of the noise on the emergency scene. So we added uh, a vibration system to it. So you retained the bell, but you added a vibration system that would give that firefighter an indication that the air was getting low. We found that still didn't adequately protect the firefighter, so we added in a heads-up display with inside the, the mask. Uh, this now gives that firefighter additional protection to let them know when they're running low of air. 
So if we want redundancy in our operational uh, protection, we certainly want redundancy in our work environment. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Luke Woods, who's going to start to cover the intricacies of passive fire protection. Okay, thank you, Sean, and uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, th this segment's really geared towards the passive fire protection, um, what, what it is, compartmentation, and so this is what I'm going to go through in the next uh, handful of minutes here. We know that fire is not new. Fire has been around since the dawn of the cane ban, uh, when he stumbled upon it accidentally. But since the, the course of time, we also have found that fires continue to be a threat, not only to the caveman, but in our society today. We, we live in a society where there's self-operating vehicles, touch screens, artificial intelligence. We talk to our Microsoft Home or Google Home instrument to turn up our temperature in our house. Um, but yet, with that sophistication, we still have to worry about fire. And why are we worried about fire even in today's age? Well, there's really two main reasons that we need to worry or, in other words, protect against fire. It's to protect the life of the people that are in the building, so the occupants, whether it's a house or a home residence or a high-rise office space. We need to protect the people that are in there so that they can safely get out of that building as well as the people that are going back into that building, the first responders, the firefighters, the EMS staff, so that they have a safe place to go and set up their firefighting operations, their search and rescue operations. We also need to protect the property. We need to ensure that that structure does not collapse, let's say prematurely or at all. And we also want to make sure that there isn't collateral damage from a fire to adjacent spaces. So, for example, if one building is on fire, we don't want that fire to spread to an adjacent building. If that happens, we could see a domino effect, ultimately a catastrophic effect, that could level a city block or perhaps even a city that we've seen in some historical fires like in Chicago or San Francisco. We want to focus on fire compartmentation, okay? and it, it's very important to think of compartmentation as a, a concept. Compartmentation, as it's defined, is really a means to separate something. And when we're talking about fire compartmentation, we're thinking of it in the essence of containing a fire or separating one space that may be involved in a fire from a space that we want to protect against the fire transitioning into that space. So fire comp compartmentation is a combination of fire-rated construction. I'll talk about what fire-rated construction is in a minute. But fire compartmentation also is its own protection. In other words, it doesn't rely on any other fire protection means, like suppression, for example, to achieve its level of fire resistance rating. In a nutshell, it's like creating a fire-rated box around a space, whether you're looking at the overall space or segregated spaces within that building. That's what fire compartmentation is. When we look at fire compartmentation in terms of building construction, and especially with respect to fire-rated construction, we can look at the, the building codes. For example, the International Building Code. I'm paraphrasing here, but it's saying that a fire resistance rated product or assembly is one that would meet the fire testing requirements of UL 263 or ASTM E119. Now, it could also be not just a product or it could be an assembly. And this photo here illustrates what some of those building elements would be. You've got a potentially fire resistance rated roof. You've got structural elements like the steel columns or concrete columns. You've got steel beams or joists. You've got fire-rated floors. And you've also got fire-rated wall assemblies, whether they're load-bearing or non-load-bearing. But all of these elements comprise of the various 
fire compartmentation construction components that help the overall building achieve its fire resistive performance. Now here's an example of fire compartmentation in effect. We're looking at a four unit building, for example. Okay, These, there are red lines between each of the four building units. Those red lines would represent a fire resistive rated wall. Okay, and let's just happen, let's say that there's a fire in one of these compartments. We don't want that fire spreading from the compartment of origin to the adjacent spaces. So the fire resistance rated wall needs to contain that fire from the adjacent spaces. So it affords people that are in that space to evacuate in enough time, the people in the adjacent spaces to evacuate in enough time, and for the fire department and the rescue team to get in to contain that fire. We've also seen cases, real life cases, where fire compartmentation has served its purpose. So these photos illustrate a building that experienced a fire. The photo on the left shows you a certain part of that building that experienced the fire. That center photo of the door in the rated corridor show you that there is some evidence of fire by way of the soot and the smoke on the wall above the door, but it also shows you that the fire was not able to breach that area and get into that space and cause disruption. The photo on the right slide illustrates the other side of that door. In other words, the, what the fire was able to impact, but not be able to transmit or communicate to the other side of that fire rated barrier. So here is a, a, an excellent example of where fire compartmentation and fire an assembly of fire rated products did its job. It kept the fire to, from one compartment and did not allow it to communicate to an adjacent space. We also see that the building codes that govern construction in existing buildings today require that certain level of fire resistance for the building components. And they also reference the different test standards to evaluate those products or systems. This is a table that would, it was taken out of the International Building Code. It's specific for glazing, but it, the highlights here are the test standards that are identified for the various fire resistance tests. So for example, if you had glazing that was used as a wall, a fire rated wall barrier, you would evaluate it to UL 263. If it was a fire rated window, you'd evaluate it to UL 9. And a fire rated door would be evaluated to UL 10C. But the code is driving and dictating at what those test standards should be. It will also prescribe the fire resistance ratings in terms of hourly or minute requirements. So for example, a four hour fire rated wall should have a three hour fire rated door in that opening. And as we saw from the previous slide, that fire rated door should be evaluated to UL 10C. The same goes for fire stop systems. Fire stop systems are referenced in the building code and the test standards to evaluate those are also noted, which would be UL 1479 or ASTM E814. I'm going to briefly talk about three different examples of the fire testing that's involved in achieving fire rated construction, but this is a good schematic of the, the different elements that go into one specific fire rated assembly. You can see here that we've got uh, the steel beams and steel joists and steel columns that represent the structural framework of the building. We've got a steel deck that's poured concrete on top of it with perhaps some reinforcement within that concrete. So the fire rating is achieved by the assembly of all these individual products to create this assembly or system 
that is then evaluated to the fire test standards. As I've mentioned before, UL 263 would be the fire test standard to evaluate fire rated construction of different building assemblies, whether it's a beam, a column, a floor, roof, or wall. We're looking at a test for a beam and a floor in this example. And the criteria for this test standard are to make sure that the applied load, so simulating the lead, die, lead excuse me, the live and dead loads that you would see in a building, still are being supported during that fire test so that we, we don't see collapse. We don't want any openings to be created in that concrete. We don't want steel temperatures to reach critical temperatures or where they might start to lose their structural stability and then have imminent collapse. So you can see that there's various conditions within these tests that we have to look for and observe for to make sure that the assembly performs appropriately and still provides that level of safety. Now if we look at a wall, for example, it's very much the same in terms of keeping fire from one side of the wall to the other. We don't want openings to occur. If it's a load-bearing wall, we apply a load to it and we need to make sure that load is being sustained for the duration of that fire test. We also don't want non-fire side temperatures to be exceeded to a, a critical point that combustible items could self-ignite. And we also want to make sure that the wall assembly withstands the impact of a hose stream. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. And then lastly, for fire stops, UL 1479 evaluates penetration fire stop systems. So for example, if we have a utility pipe that goes through a fire rated wall, we need to make sure that there's continuity of fire protection from the wall and the opening that's created for that utility pipe. So we're looking at making sure that fire doesn't go through the opening that's created by that utility pipe that is blocked by fire stopping material. We want to make sure that temperatures aren't exceeded on the unexposed side. And we also want to make sure that the hose stream is withstood during the fire test. Now this is a, a short video about the hose stream test itself. And what you're seeing is after the fire testing has been done for the through penetrations, we take the frame off of the furnace and we apply the impact of a hose stream across the test sample. And what we're doing here is testing the integrity of not only the wall system, but primarily the fire stop system to make sure that it's robust enough to withstand any impact that could occur on that assembly during the test. What we want to make sure of is that there aren't any openings created on the non-fire side. Openings, of course, would be an avenue for heat and fire to get through, and then we've lost our compartmentation. I mentioned a couple of test standards, UL 263, UL 1479. There are other standard development organizations other than UL, for example, NFPA and ASTM, and there's many around the world. But I, I'm highlighting this in, to give you a sense of knowing that there's different test standards for different applications. Sometimes there's standards that are synonymous with each other, as I mentioned, UL 263 or ASTM E119. They're essentially the, the same fire test standard, and the building code, in many sense, references them as the same test. But it's important for you to identify that they, the test standards that are being evaluated for these products and systems are noted in the building code and are generated and maintained by standard development organizations. It's also extremely important to understand the difference between different fire test standards. For example, there's a fire test standard that evaluates the flame spread across a material. That's UL723 or ASTM E84. And that utilizes a Steiner tunnel test apparatus, not a furnace apparatus, to look at flame spreading across a sample. Versus UL263 that looks at building products and building assemblies that uses a furnace test. It's very important to know the difference of these tests and the products that are tested to them 
to know that the products and the assemblies are fit for purpose. It's also very critical to look at the certification labels itself. When we test and certify a product, it's required to have a certification label applied to the product or the packaging, and that label will identify what the product is, the test standard it's evaluated for, and the properties that it's qualified for. On the left side of the screen, you see that this is a spray-applied fire-resistant material. It's a fire-resistant classification. Okay, so fire resistance, that means something specific. That's a UL263 test versus the right side of the screen that is a cementitious mixture, but it's a certification for surface burning characteristics. That's a UL723 test. It's very important to understand that a UL723 certified product is not intended to satisfy a code requirement or a construction specification that references a UL263 product or certification. So please make sure you look at the certification labels to identify what the product is and its limitations. Okay, Sean, I think I'm handing Thank it back you. to you. Thank you. I feel like two news anchors here. Thank you, Luke, for that fine report. But, uh, no, I, I think it's, you know, you hit on the, the difference between 723 and 263. That, that we can't emphasize that enough to the fire service because so many times we, uh, we see that being confused in the field. But from a fire service perspective, why is building compartmentation so important? And if you think about our tactical uh, options within a, during a fire, especially in a building, uh, a high-rise building, or a very large building. There's compartmentation built in, one to keep that fire in place, hopefully, but it also permits the fire service to start to stage within that building and then initiate an interior attack or suppression attack. So if you think about a high-rise building, if we have a fire on the 15th floor, we'll typically go and start to assemble our troops on the 12th floor, make an operational floor on the 13th floor where we start to deploy the, the crews up to the next two floors to initiate an attack. We can only do that if we're sure that our crews are protected. So even as we start to advance down a hallway, we want to make sure that that barrier there that's protecting our firefighters to give them the opportunity to advance in order to get to the room of origin or where the fire may be, they need to have that protection. What they can't have is fire all of a sudden sprouting out behind them and cutting off their means of egress, especially if they're in a high-rise building or a very large building where getting out of that area could be very challenging and very difficult. Uh, remember with our SCBAs, with our breathing apparatus, typically the U.S. Fire Service has a 30-minute uh, cylinder. When you're working very hard and breathing very hard, that cylinder will last less than 20 minutes. So time is of the essence and protecting the operational area of those firefighters is very important. Now, today we're, we're focusing on fire stopping. And what is fire stopping? And my friend John could probably spend the next hour telling you what fire stopping is. But for simplistic terms here, it's a third party tested product or system to seal penetrance, gaps, or openings in a fire rated wall or floor to restore the rating of the barrier compromised by such openings. Meaning, if I have a two hour rated wall, and the cable guy comes through and wants to put cable in for everybody in that structure, we got to bring that wall back up to two hours. Because when they start to make openings within that wall, it starts to compromise the operational time of that wall. So we have strategies or we have systems in fire stopping that can bring that wall back up to that two hour rating. There are multiple products out there. I'm not going to say products, I'm going to say systems because we really want to refer to fire stop as systems. It's a combination of products that are working together to provide the protection that is required. You can use an intumescent material. Uh, if you're old enough to remember those little snakes that we had on 4th of July, you put a little flame to them and they'd start to grow. That's the concept in a very rudimentary way of the intumescent material. That opening is there until the heat, the flames start to press upon that material cause it to start to grow and seal the opening. Uh, if you look in the middle picture, you have 
these these bricks that can go in. So it gives actually some flexibility to that building, the owners and operators or uh, the trades that may come in. Uh, they have some uh, flexibility in what they're going to run through that opening, given that they put the bricks back in properly. And then on your right, we have some sleeve protections that go in through the wall in that in that um, demonstration. So I have a video here. It's it's a little bit uh, it's a six minute video, but we're not going to play the whole video. This video is available on the International Fire Stop Council's webpage. It's also available on the UL webpage for its entirety. So I'll just play a portion of it. It was a demonstration to really show the importance of properly installing and maintaining fire stop system. This video is a collaboration of the International Fire Stop Council, a not-for-profit association dedicated to promoting the technology of fire and smoke containment in modern building construction, and UL, a premier global safety science company dedicated to evolving the future of safety. Structure fires have tremendous consequences. Proper understanding of fire containment standards can save lives. According to the National Fire Protection Association, in 2010, structure fires accounted for only 37% of fires, but 85% of civilian deaths and 84% of direct property damage. In numbers, that's 2,755 deaths and $97 billion in property damages. Optimized fire protection requires a comprehensive approach, including careful attention to passive fire and smoke containment. This video focuses on containment through the installation of tested and certified code compliance systems in wall, floor, ceiling penetrations, and joints. It is critical to keep in mind that effective fire stopping requires accurate adherence to a precise combination of components and conditions that have been tested as a system to determine their fire resistance capacity. These listed fire stop system components include the penetrated substrate, the size and material of the penetrating item, the size and shape of the penetration hole, insulating materials and sealant, and the quantity, type, and installation method for the full system. Deviation from any of a listed system's components severely compromises the overall effectiveness of the fire stop. Incorrect fire stop installations are unfortunately too common. And in the event of a fire, the consequences could include preventable, dangerous exposure to fire and smoke for egressing building occupants and responding firefighters, as well as excessive property damage. The test scenarios featured in this video were created in UL facilities and designed to simulate realistic room configurations and fire progression. Each scenario includes a matched set of penetrations and joints, one that is fire stopped correctly using a UL listed fire stop design, and one that is fire stopped incorrectly using an unrated design. All correct materials and installations represented in this video comply with UL 1479 for penetrations and UL 2079 for joints. These initial scenarios illustrate a very common mistake. While fire stop sealants have been used in the incorrect installations, they're not the appropriate products specifically listed for these applications. In the case of the plastic pipe, the non-compliant installation results in a complete failure of fire and smoke containment within a short time. For the tested cable bundle scenario, the non-compliant installation resulted in a considerable amount of smoke passage within a short time due to the fact that fire stop putty listed as part of some tested cable penetration systems was used in a way that did not fully meet the tested system's installation requirements. Attention to detail is critical. In this scenario showing a copper tube, the installations are identical with the exception of the insulation material. Use of the non-compliant insulation results in rapid spread of fire and smoke and demonstrates the importance of matching every detail to the listed system. Even materials with respectable fire properties will not hold up if used inappropriately. The hole for the five conduits on the left uses glass fiber insulation, a material that does well in non-combustibility, but in the event of a fire, softens and yields considerably. Its lack of suitability for this installation 
allows smoke and hot gases to pass rapidly through the fiberglass stuffed openings. The temptation to use materials all Okay, I, I know I cut the video short, but I want to be cognizant of time for everybody. But as you see in this slide, uh, why is the fire stop in inspection important to the fire service? Well, not everybody respects the, uh, the small indication on that wall right there that this is a fire rated wall. And as you can see, this large opening has been created and no one has gone back and repaired it. And that's, that's the lesson that we want to take away from here. If you look at the left, uh, we see these openings that have been created here. Each one of these openings is a potential pathway, not only for the flame, but also for the deadly toxic smoke that may be penetrating through, uh, that could put the occupant at risk, that could start to incapacitate that, that occupant very early in the event. Uh, the good news here, though, is, is if you catch it, you can fix it. And that's why, as a fire service, as we go through, you could be doing a familiarity inspection, as something as little as that. If you're starting to be cognizant of your surroundings, looking around, and you can identify these, you can start to make these references over to the Fire Prevention Bureau for further follow-up. Uh, if you're like Cleveland and we're starting to rely more on our frontline companies to do the frontline inspections and then report potential uh, violations to their fire or to the Fire Prevention Bureau, it becomes very important that we start to teach our firefighters and our officers what they should be looking for. When you pop up this drop ceiling, you should start to an indication that this is a fire rated wall or a barrier. Any of these openings in this barrier should give you an indication that you have a potential problem. Again, these openings, these gaps, not only put that occupant at risk, but they start to put our operating firefighters at risk. So where do we look? Well, we should be checking electrical mechanical closets. Uh, we're saying, oh, come on, a closet, is that important? I'm not into telling war stories, but Easter Sunday, 2016, we had a, a reported alarm going off in our Cleveland Center One building, which is a 35-story building. As I was pulling up, uh, typically, as if you're from the fire service, you know in security's waiting there and go, oh, yeah, someone's cooking popcorn. Uh, when you saw the panic look on security, you knew you had something. And there was heavy smoke on the 16th and 17th floor. And I should say the 16th floor, I'm sorry. So uh, we deployed our crews, called for a second alarm. And as we, we went up there, we found heavy smoke on the 16th floor. But what we did find is that this fire was con confined to this electrical closet. And as we started to uh, complete extinguishment, it was a small fire that generated a lot of smoke. We completed extinguishment, got rid of the smoke, looked at this utility closet, and the fire stopping systems worked. All those fire stopping systems, the intumescent materials activated, sealed it. The fire did not get out of that closet. It didn't get up into the chaseway, and it kept that fire confined right to that closet. Again, this was Easter Sunday, so it could have gotten a head start if that fire stop system had not been installed properly and maintained properly. Uh, we should actually pop a drop ceiling or two to check above that ceiling to see if the protections are in place. Uh, look for fire rated doors. Have they been compromised? Are they propped open? Have they been changed? Uh, we need to look for dampers. Fire inspectors, as you're doing through it, I've talked to people within the industry that believe that the inspectors are only looking for the little uh, access door. They see the access door, access door, they assume the damper's installed. Uh, in some cases, the damper may not be there. So we, we really need to do our homework as we're walking through. As I said, when we can find these problems on the top of the page here, these unprotected openings, the good news for us is if we catch it, we can, we can make the changes. We can make the corrections that now provide that protection for our crew members. Uh, as you go through that occupancy, start to ask for maintenance or start to ask for that building engineer. Uh, start to know some, get someone who understands that building and can really start to explain the uses of the building and what should be in place. Uh, again, to reiterate the importance of a balanced approach, we want to we want to control that fire into an area. Uh, we want early detection to notify the responding fire department, but also to notify the occupants to start their 
egress, but we, we want to contain that fire, but we also want to suppress that fire. And to suppress that fire means to put water on it. Uh, anytime we could put water on the fire, that's a good thing, to put the fire out except for dealing with magnesium fires. That's a different story. But even NFPA 101 starts to recognize that, that we shouldn't rely on one form of protection in order to provide the safeguard for those occupants. We really need to look at a balanced approach. So if we have a building that is totally compartmented, do we still need sprinklers? Well, we're seeing in today's modern fire environment that we're dealing with significant fuel load, that this fire can get a head start and can grow very rapidly. So the best intervention is to get water on it as quickly as possible. So that calls for the combination. This next video is actually a recreation by NIST of the Station Nightclub fire in Rhode Island that killed 100 people. You, if you've seen, if anyone here has seen the raw footage of this, uh, ironically, there was a news story or a news team on site. They were doing a story on the safety of nightclubs due to a nightclub incident that had occurred in Chicago. Uh, the band that was playing played until 30 seconds into this video. So think about that. 30 seconds, the band was still playing. So you see the fire growing on the foam at the back of the stage here. Right at that 25 second mark, what do you see in the right side? You see those sprinkler heads activate. Again, sprinklers aren't always gonna completely extinguish this fire. But what the sprinklers will do, will start to manage that fire. and will start to manage the growth of the fire, providing egress time for those occupants. So if we look at the differences between the two sides, the left side being non-sprinklered, the right side being sprinklered, we start to see the rapid progression of fire here on the left. Think about this place was overfilled. Uh, people who may um, were watching a band playing and then started to realize that they had a problem. Most of the people there tried to go out the way they came in, which caused a bottleneck at the means of egress. You see, we're a minute into this scenario and conditions are already untenable for most occupants. Look at that thermal layer as it banks down to the floor. Look at that rapid fire growth. Is this a survivable or tenable atmosphere for an occupant? Absolutely not. But if you look at the right-hand side, is it a tenable occupancy for an occupant? It is. When we start to look at the oxygen levels, the temperature levels, uh, will they come out a little bit snotty, a little bit coughing, a little bit hoarse? Yes, but at least they'll be able to make their way out. So that's the importance of a balanced approach. Uh, know your local codes. Uh, most of our jurisdictions are basing their codes on the model codes, whether it's the International Building Code, the International Fire Code, or NFPA 1, which is their fire code, or NFPA 101, their life safety code. Typically what happens is the ICC is on a three-year cycle. The ICC will publish their code, whether it's 2018, 2021 model, then the local states will start to go through their process of reviewing the codes and then adopting it to their local jurisdiction. Uh, then in some jurisdictions like Cleveland, um, we're a charter city, we'll go through our own process of adopting our municipal code, but it's still based on the Ohio code, which is based on the IBC or ICC family. What can happen sometimes as you go through those local state or local municipal amendments or adoption processes, you could start to have amendments apply. Such as a few years ago when single family homes, when we were able to get the protection of lightweight floor systems, some states remove that protection out at the state level. Or residential sprinkler systems, some states remove that out of the state level. So um, when we, you know, I can go on and on with examples, we don't have time, but that, that's the importance of us being involved or the fire service being involved in that code adoption. Remember those model codes are minimum codes. We don't want to remove criteria out of those minimum codes. The International Fire Code in 2012, we were able to get in, uh, adopted into that code 701.6, which makes the owner's responsibility to inspect their passive fire protection. This doesn't require the fire department to go in and inspect every building and every fire stop system. Rather, it puts the onus on that owner to ensure that each one of these systems is visually inspected and it remains in place. If it is not or if it's been compromised, 
they need to be repaired. Now, as a local jurisdiction, you have options on how to handle that. You might have the, the resources in order to perform these inspections, and God bless you, please do it. If you don't, you can start to either have that owner retain that inspection information on file or submit it to you annually. It's very similar to what we have done in our jurisdiction when it comes to sprinkler inspections, that they submit that to the local fire prevention bureau on an annual basis. Uh, a service that you will provide is uh, we can provide a third service to do that fire stop inspection. So if in your jurisdiction, the owner says, I don't have the capability of this, I don't have the expertise, I don't know who to turn to, uh, UL is an option to provide that service, as, the, as well as other third service providers out there. Are there licensed or certified contractors to ensure that the fire stop systems are installed properly? And the answer is yes. UL actually operates a qualified fire stop contractor program where the contractors actually come to UL they go through training and they go through a testing process to ensure that they're competent and able to install these systems properly. Uh, Luke, I'm gonna turn it over to you so you can talk about some additional resources that we have here at UL. Yeah, thank you, Sean. So I know in the last hour we threw a lot of information out there, probably spoke rather quickly or maybe used terms that aren't commonplace um, but one of the ways that you can really tie a lot of this together is using the resources that are available to you. Uh, UL provides a lot of different resources, whether it's uh, publications, training materials, databases, chat, online chat support. I would encourage you to just visit UL.com. It's a relatively easy website to navigate to. Uh, search engines are, are chucked into this website. Um, and, and I'll go through a couple of different resources, but it, it's very important to help tie a lot of this information together by following up and looking at some of the resources that are available to you. The first one that's uh, of relevance, certainly for Firestop, the Firestop community, whether you're a manufacturer, a contractor, an inspector, an architect, building owner, etc., is the, the UL Online Certification Directory. This is a database where you can by input a couple of keywords and populate a list of currently UL certified products or systems. And one way you can validate if a Firestop system is still current is putting it in the online certification directory. You can search by manufacturer's name, you can search by design number, and it will populate the various systems based on your input. So it's a very valuable tool. We also have a database that's called Product Spec. It is a search engine that will ultimately get you to a UL design or a UL certified manufacturer or contractor, but it also has a code feature by way of putting in a code section or a UL certified product name, and it will associate that product or that code section to the various UL certified products so if you're looking at the International Building Code Chapter 7, it will identify the different sections of Chapter 7 and then associate the various fire protective solutions that UL certifies for that code section. UL, the UL Online Certification Directory can be found by going to ul.com, scrolling all the way to the bottom of the page and clicking on the Certification Directory, or what we call Product IQ. We also publish information on the UL guide pages, which are the introductory pages for each UL category that we certify products to. For example, UL Firestop systems have their own category that we certify the products to. And the introduction to that category is where we put the general information for that category. It talks about what the products are, the different test standards that are evaluated, the criteria that we use to test and certify the products to. There's a lot of information in there, the marking requirements that need to go on the products. So the guide information page is another good resource for you. So the bottom line is know your resources and utilize them. In, in closing for this seminar today, we hope that you, you took away some useful information that helps you to better assess the conditions for fire-rated construction, identifying what they are and how to utilize them. But 
the, the takeaways here for me are knowing that we're always going to be confronted with the threat of fire, right? We've seen it for thousands of years, even though other technologies have come and gone, fire still remains current in our day-to-day -day lives. The, the picture on the right is really intended to illustrate that, the evolution of not only fire, but fire protection. This is a picture where we don't necessarily see a fire service showing up in a horse and a wagon anymore. The technology has changed drastically, and fire protection will as well, even though the threat of fire will always exist. Fire testing and certified products are the way to help identify if a product or a system is fit for purpose, whether it's satisfying the building code and a construction specification, and ultimately meeting the intent of the building code, which is to protect the property and to protect the occupants. We gave you some examples of different test standards and what the differences are, the criteria that they're evaluated for, in some cases, the apparatuses that are used to evaluate these products or systems, understand the differences. So even if you see a UL certification mark on a product, look a little bit further, see what it's certified for, and understand what those potential limitations are. You want to make sure that the right product was used for the right job. Use all the resources that are available for you. Ask questions. <coughs> And make sure that if you have any doubts that you, you contact the competent resources, whether it's the UL staff uh, or those that are associated with UL. So be prepared. Thanks, Luke. And just, you know, as an example, that Station Nightclub fire, the manufacturers promoted that it met UL 94. UL 94 is for measuring the foam inside of a, an appliance to deaden the sound no application whatsoever on how they used it. So, uh, Luke, I'm glad you, you mentioned that. You know, ask for the application if it's right. And to those in the fire service who have ever done an EMPERS report, the National Fire Incident Reporting System, they can be a real pain in the behind. But it's very critical that we complete these reports and complete them fully because this data is actually used by the U.S. Fire Administration. And that U.S. Fire Administration goes through these reports and then publishes the data from these reports. Um, you know, what did you observe? Where was the room of origin? Did it come out of the room of origin? And what pathway did it spread? How did it spread? Check these boxes. And if the, pick, if the, if the fire doesn't match exactly what those drop downs tell you, use the narrative. Because I can tell you that USFA does scrub those narratives to start to try to get as best of a comprehensive picture as they can on the conditions in a fire today in the US. Because there are many times that we've gone to code hearings or in standards discussions where we've gone up and started talking about what we perceive as being the fire problem, only to have the statistics not back us up. We knew what we were experiencing, but the statistics weren't telling us the same story. So it's critical that we fill out those NFERS report completely and fully. Uh, we appreciate the time that you spent with us. We're willing uh, to sit around for a few more minutes for questions. At the end of the day, our goal is not to put any more names in our memorial. This is our memorial in Cleveland. We have 77 names on this memorial, including my uncle's. Uh, the goal is not to put 78 or 79. Uh, we can never remove the total risk from firefighting operations. The goal is to start to manage that risk, manage it through understanding and knowledge, and managing it through ensuring that the work environment is as safe as we reasonably can make it. Thank you very much, and uh, I'll turn it over. John, I think you're handling the questions or selecting questions. Yeah, we do have a couple questions. Um, the first one is, as a suppression officer, what do I do if I'm unsure there is a violation? Oh, that's a good question. Great question. Um, I, I, per, I approached it that if it didn't look right to me, I became suspect. And a simple phone call, you can call your local fire prevention bureau and consult with one of your fire inspectors. If you don't have that local fire prevention bureau, you should have some type of resource within your local community. If not, you can reach out to our regulatory services here at UL. If you go online to ul.com, you will find regulatory services and there'll be representatives for your local state. 
you can send an email to that uh, to that representative, whether it's John Roberts, Bruce Johnson, Rich Walke, Howard Hopper, and they can help to start to answer your questions. Thanks, Sean. Um, I have another one. How would I get involved in the codes process? Well, the ICC process and NFPA process are open for anyone's involvement. Uh, NFPA see, tends to be more committee-centric, meaning that uh, you apply to be placed on a committee. If you're selected for that committee, then you'll participate. Uh, the committees do allow people to attend their in-person meetings, uh, but you have to have the approval of the chair in order to speak. The ICC is a little bit, uh, I don't want to say more open, but it's, it's, it's conducted a little bit more publicly in the sense that um, anyone can submit a code change to the ICC process. You do it through their ICC website, iccsafe.org. Uh, you, you have uh, various timetables in order to submit those as they go through their cycle. And then they'll hold a public uh, committee hearing. So um, the committee action hearing is held usually in spring. Uh, you can apply to be on a committee also. So uh, they'll select a committee from 13 to 14 individuals. Uh, proponents of code change proposals will go and have two minutes to argue in favor of a specific change. The uh, opponents will also have two minutes to argue their perspective of that change in front of the committee. And then there's rebuttal and re-rebuttal. And at the end, the committee can either approve, disapprove, or approve as modified. Those changes are then posted uh, for public comment, where again, anybody could submit a public comment whether you want to modify the change or you want to submit it as approved for approval or disapproval. And then the final action hearings will be in fall. In fact, this year they're next week in Richmond, Virginia. So uh, you can go to iccsafe.org. You can see what the schedule is. You can attend in person. You can submit for a committee. Um, Heck, if, if you're a representative from your local jurisdiction, you don't even have to attend anything. You can go online and vote. So there really is no excuse not to participate. So check to see if your local jurisdiction is an ICC representative. And if you're interested, ask to be one of those representatives that can then go and vote online during the ICC process. Uh, I encourage anybody from the fire service to participate both in the NFPA and ICC process and building officials too. I don't want to limited just to fire officials. That was our focus today. Thanks, Sean. John, I think we have a few more questions. Do you want to take it from here? Yeah, John Valulis here with the International Fire Stop Council. Uh, one person asked, how do we deal with engineering judgments? And here was the, the comment added to that. It said, most of the time, EJs don't make sense. And then the, uh, the uh, follow-up question to that was, and why doesn't UL supervise engineering judgments? So very good question. So what are engineering judgments? Uh, an engineering judgment is something created typically by the manufacturer of the Firestop product. Uh, it will address a situation where one of the tested and listed systems or none of the tested and listed Firestop systems address the situation. Now, in case you're thinking, well, why don't we have systems for everything? Just imagine this very simple scenario. Um, someone cores a hole in concrete for, for fire stopping. I mean, uh, for penetration. And then they realize that they cored it in the wrong place. So they move their coring rig over by four inches, and suddenly it's a figure eight shaped hole. Well, you will find uh, hundreds of fire stop systems for round holes and square holes. You will not find any systems for a hole made in a figure eight. Uh, so, just a very simple example of how real life can complicate uh, things that seem simple in a UL system. So, an engineering judgment is where the manufacturer is asked. Uh, for a system or a solution that would be expected to pass the fire test. Um, so the question was, uh, how do we handle them? So here's my answer to that, is that uh, about 20 years ago, the International Fire Stop Council published a set of guidelines for the evaluation of engineering judgments. So it's not for the development of engineering judgments. It really is focused to the person receiving an engineering judgment. Uh, so what the recipient can and should do is take a look at those guidelines, if you don't have them, all you have to do, do is uh, Google IFC Engineering Judgment Guidelines, and I suspect you'll get right to the correct page. Uh, and basically, it walks you through what you want to see on the engineering judgment. 
Now, if you wanted a 30-second course on it, here's the shortcut, here's the secret, is what you want to look for on the engineering judgment is the reference tested systems that the engineering judgment is based on. Uh, an engineering judgment, although the word engineering is there, should not be based on pure imagination. It should be based on an actual fire test or several fire tests and then interpolating or extrapolating those fire tests. And so what you want to look for on the engineering judgment are the system numbers that the engineering judgment is based on. And what I would recommend to you if you want to know how to make sense of that engineering judgment or perhaps to decide if you should accept it or not is to open up those systems so you can find them at the UL website, as Luke showed you. Uh, another way is just Google the UL system numbers that are referenced, and usually that will pop up the system drawing and the listing. And take a look if it's similar. As an example, you get an engineering judgment for a plastic pipe uh, going through concrete. You uh, take a look at the uh, UL system numbers. If the system numbers seem to be for plastic pipes through concrete, you know you're at least working in the right direction. If, on the other hand, uh, the reference systems were for metal pipes through concrete, I would probably be tempted not to accept that engineering judgment. If the reference systems were for a plastic pipe, perhaps going through gypsum board, again, I might be tempted not to accept that engineering judgment. So the main thing you want to look for is that the engineering judgment is uh, similar enough in nature to the tested system. Now, a person also asked very quickly, uh, you know, why doesn't UL supervise their engineering, engineering judgment? Uh, believe it or not, over the course of a year, I suspect over the entire fire stop industry in North America, there are probably tens of thousands of engineering judgments issued by all the manufacturers together. Uh, many of the manufacturers have staffs of five to six to seven people even, uh, doing nothing but evaluating engineering judgment requests. And so clearly it just would not be feasible for UL, at least at present staffing levels, to evaluate them all. Uh, perhaps one day if they wanted to hire 30 people or so, um, just to do that, it could happen, uh, but certainly wouldn't be feasible today. Uh, John, would you like to grab another question? Okay, I can uh, take another quickie. Um, why do uh, three hour fire? Why do you have only a three hour fire door and a four hour fire rated wall? So again, just a quick quickie. Uh, this is a philosophy we've had certainly in North America for probably close to a hundred years. It's assumed that a fire door never needs the same rating as the underlying wall, because for the door to work, there has to be no combustibles in front of the door or behind the door. Otherwise, it doesn't work as, as a door. Uh, you have to move in and out of the room. Um, and so because we've always assumed that uh, a fire rated door would not have combustibles on either side of it, uh, this is why essentially in this country at least, and, and Canada as well, we've always accepted uh, the rated doors to have a lower fire rating than the wall that, that it's installed in. Thanks so much, John. I think we have time for one more question and the rest we would be answering individually. Okay, I'll take one. Um, I'll read it out. Considering the video of a natural room versus oh. aesthetic room burn time, okay, is it fair yeah. to say that evacuation time for all buildings, including high-rise buildings, is inc decreasing due to building products, for example, foam insulation, ethos, etc.? Um, the response to that is that um, yes and no. Uh, perhaps we should be including uh, a longer time. Uh, in a way, this is what the building codes have strived for by requiring sprinklers, automatic sprinkler systems in more and more buildings. Uh, as the building gets very tall or very broad, uh, the building codes will require sprinklers, and one of the uh, chief results of sprinklers when they do operate is to obviously provide more time for egress. And so, yes, the building code development process, I think, is cognizant of that the factor uh, that we perhaps we need longer egress times than before, or, or shorter egress times, I should say, than before, um, and to provide more time because people haven't gotten any faster. If anything, we're getting older as a population, uh, less mobile, uh, that knowing that the building presents more of a risk, uh, there are things being built into the building code to allow people more time to egress the building. John, and also we, we are doing some studies. Uh, Jason Averill at NIST did some studies looking at the evacuation of specifically high-rise buildings. Uh, after 9-11, we started to address uh, the width of some of these uh, stairways to try to uh, give more space for not only the egress of occupants, but also the entrance and accessibility for firefighters who are ascending those stairs uh, to recognize that uh, sometimes egress times can be of a concern. 
welcome. Thanks so much, Luke, Sean, and John, for the informative presentation. Thanks to everyone for taking time out today to participate.